Warm welcome to World Water Week's live studio talk shows. Welcome to everyone joining us online and a heartful welcome for everyone here on site with us. As we immerse ourselves in those live studio talk shows, now we have the great opportunity to immerse more into the topic of wetlands, especially wetlands in West Africa. Uh, I'm looking forward for to learn more uh, about these issues, and for that I'm delighted to have both of you here uh, with us. Two experts working on this, they're going to share a lot of knowledge and also methods uh, for us. Can you please introduce yourself shortly, if you start? I'm Julie Mulonga. Um, I work for Wetlands International as the Director Eastern Africa. Thank you. Thank you. My name is uh, Jeroen Jurians. I work for Wetlands International at the Global Office in the Netherlands, uh, but working closely with our Eastern Africa office uh, on issues around wetlands. Mm. Thank you. Many of us know that wetlands serve as protectors mm -hmm. against climate change and also of the ongoing loss of biodiversity. But just to get everybody watching more on board, could you share more, explain more to us what is the current situation for wetlands, especially in West Africa? Okay, so I'll start from the global level and I'll start with a definition. So wetlands are said to exist where water meets land. A lot of people actually think of wetlands at, as wastelands, but they're not wastelands. Did you say wastelands? Wastelands. Wow. So I think of them as kidneys of the earth. Wow. They actually collect water, they store it, and they slowly release it. So they have various advantages, especially for the millions of people in Africa who depend on them for their livelihoods. More importantly, they actually store carbon three times more carbon um, than actually the other ecosystems, especially the terrestrial ecosystems. So as Wetlands International, we work on the management and restoration of wetlands. So globally, we find that um, a report by the Global Wetland Outlook actually said that 35% of our wetlands have been lost over the years. 35%? 35%. And in Africa, the same is mirrored. In some areas, it's actually much more than 35%. No, just if I paused you there, because it's like, also when you describe, which is so clear when you say that, that they serve as, the, as kidneys, mm -hmm. what, is, what are the consequences if we lost like 35% of the kidneys that the earth need? A lot of the communities who depend on them, for example, for water. If I go to the village, I talk to a woman out there in the village who's depending on that wetland for fish. She can no longer get that fish. And therefore that um, sort of um, her livelihood is, is interrupted with. And then carbon, if we destroy them, a lot of carbon is then released into the atmosphere. And we are already fighting with the effects of global warming, climate change. So indeed, wetlands are very key when it comes to providing a lot of these services to the communities. So we really need to keep them intact. Mm. Thank you. And can you share more about, you, you're saying like the work that you as, the work that you're doing to, to preserve and yeah, maintain the, the importance of the wetlands so they function for, for the community around them, for, but for all of us. Sure. One of the things we did uh, within Eastern Africa, we developed a 10-year initiative called, called Source to Sea. Yeah. And I'm happy to say that CEDA really saw the need for this initiative and came in and jump-started and they're funding this initiative. So with this initiative, we are working in two different landscapes. One of them is what we are calling the Rift Valley ecoregion within Eastern Africa. And the second one is the coastal ecoregion. So what's unique about this initiative is that we are actually moving away from our comfort zones. We are thinking about in the Central Rift Valley, for example, doing landscape planning. So a lot of times we plan only at the site. But we don't think about what's happening beyond the site. Mm. 
So with this initiative, we're thinking of landscape planning, bringing different stakeholders together, and being able to then come up with visions for our different landscapes. We're thinking of restoration, not just restoration of a few acres of land, but large pieces of land, especially in the Central Rift Valley. Yeah. And we've already started on that. The same thing in the mangrove ecoregion. We are using very unique approaches such as man ecological mangrove restoration. We are really encouraging people to actually let the ecosystems regenerate on their own rather than planting trees. Wow. Because a lot of times when you plant, a lot of that planting actually fails. Mm -hmm. And of course, the last thing is that the knowledge is not there. So when you go to the mangrove ecoregions, one of the things that we've actually brought on board is what we are calling the mangrove, um, the global mangrove watch, a very okay. inno innovative approach, which where, where we're able to use a, um, technology to actually monitor the mangroves. Wow, you're, you're sharing so much knowledge and I want to ask like so many <laughs> follow-up questions yeah. that I, yeah. which I will do. Yeah. So we come back especially to, to the innovations and also to hear more about the results mm -hmm. so far, because it's like you're done or you're doing mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. a lot of work that really is driving transformation. So it would be nice also to hear the results for, mm -hmm. for the ones in the village, but also to broaden their perspective and to invite you to the dialogue as well. Thank you. Uh, both if you have any comments or things to add from what has been said, but also to share the perspective of the work the Westland International is doing in Indonesia. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'm working closely with uh, Julie and the team in Eastern Africa as well on the programs that uh, Julie explained. So why bring in a perspective from Indonesia? Yeah. Uh, it's actually because Wetlands International and partners of the Building with Nature Indonesia uh, program have worked in uh, Damak uh, on the north coast of uh, Java on a program on nature-based solutions, mm -hmm. on restoring a very degraded um, coastal uh, uh, area. And we've done it in a very successful way. It's a decade of experience that we uh, employ there. And we actually want to bring uh, those knowledge approaches, tools applied and lessons learned to uh, the Ethiopia context and have the cross exchanges and learning. You're doing it or you want to do it? Uh, we are, well, I should say we are doing it. Because okay. we started <laughs> um, at the global level, an initiative in collaboration with the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, SIDA, yeah. um, on Wetlands for Resilience. Uh, it's called the Wetlands for Resilience Initiative, which aims to upscale uh, the wetlands restoration globally to meet those targets that uh, uh, Julie was referring to of the global yeah. biodiversity framework. And if I pause it just also to, to follow for us that are not experts, mm -hmm. it, it seems like you have like you have f in many places, but you have like a lot of knowledge and results from things that had worked in Indonesia that you now see how can they be adapted and upscaled Indeed. for for example in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes, that's very correct. Okay. <laughs> um, and we want to share that to Ethiopia, but we also want to share it to the world. I mean, this Wetlands for Resilience initiative really aims to bring those knowledges and lessons also from Ethiopia or the landscapes we work in to the world to accelerate um, landscape restoration worldwide. We actually see landscape restoration being featured high on the agenda, but the putting water and wetlands central to uh, landscape restoration is actually the area that needs more attention. Yeah. And that's exactly what this initiative is for, to put that forward to the world and to accelerate action on that. I think the case uh, of Indonesia, uh, it's applying nature-based solutions uh, in an innovative, uh, simple way. What uh, had happened in the eroded coastline where mangrove has disappeared, uh, leaving uh, communities vulnerable for flooding. Um, what you, you, I, I love that you're sharing so much, but if you slow down a little bit, in okay, your, because it's just like it's good. You're like pushing so much, <laughs> like for us to. You're like you're so sorry, much it's knowledge. I you're think breathing. It's the <laughs> Thank you. Apologies. It's uh, the excitement about. Uh, yeah, I work, see that. Uh, it's like, but I'm like, okay. Yes. <laughs> so the innovative nature-based solutions applied there is putting a permeable um, bamboo structure in the in the water so that the waves can come in with the sediment. Sediment is being trapped and seedlings of mangrove varieties are kept so that they can regrow naturally, like mm -hmm. ecological mangrove restoration. Wow. Uh, communities are heavily involved. They actually put in place uh, the bamboo structures. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually maintain them. 
and we apply an innovative approach called the bio-rights approach. bio right. Yes, mm -hmm. where actually community groups get loans to uh, employ alternative livelihood uh, methodologies uh, in that area, for example, making uh, improved aquaculture, um, which also has like mangrove uh, up front, mm. um, and they get loans for that. And as soon as they meet restoration uh, charges that have been set, um, the loan will become a grant. So uh, wow. the, the restoration charging includes then having the structure in place, having it well maintained uh, so that the mangroves uh, re regain. So it's combining livelihoods and uh, natural um, restoration uh, work. And, and it's been very successful. It's been awarded actually uh, several awards, but it's also featuring as one of the flagship programs of the UN Decade for res on Restoration. Wow. Uh, so more information can be found uh, for the audience listening as well uh, online. That's beautiful. Thank you. And thank you for explaining. It's like I, I could see how the community was building mm -hmm. the, ba the bamboo things and the mangrove com coming back. Yeah. And you're sharing like a lot of, like we were saying also, like the innovations and the work that you're working mm -hmm. inclusively with the community. Mm -hmm. What opportunities, because we also see there's an urgency to, mm -hmm. to upscale mm -hmm. and to, to include more so not more loose, not more society's loose important mm -hmm. kidneys or like the, the, the gem that wetlands are. Mm -hmm. What are you doing now to, how is the work with upscaling these plants working and what are the challenges also around it? Um, one thing I'd talk about is the integrated landscape management approaches. I think that forces you to move away from your comfort zones because you're bringing all stakeholders to the table and really developing visions for that landscape and developing propositions. Mm. So you're looking for win-win situations. It's like when you bring people to a table, you all want to agree on one thing for that landscape. Yeah. So we've learned that from Indonesia. It's something they've been doing for a long time. And also but to pause and clarify, because it sounds, you bring different stakeholders yes. and you create a common vision together. Yes. Yes. Yes, yeah. we do that. Yeah. So of course that has challenges because everybody comes there with their vested interests. So we really, it takes time. We have to sit down, talk, and come to an agreement. And as I was saying, it is possible. The other thing, the other good thing is the ecoregion approach. We've also learned that from the Indonesia case. You know, you don't have to work just at a site. You can expand your thinking to other sites. And in that way, you're able to upscale. Of course, the other challenge I'd say here, you're bringing in different sectors again, sectors who are not very comfortable working together. Environment and water are comfortable, but when you bring in agriculture, that's a different thing. You bring in all these people, so bringing them to the table, they're not very comfortable with that. Mm. Um, and then, <laughs> sorry if I'm talking. No, it's, it's Let really me know, but I'm passionate yeah, about I this. Yeah, I see both of you. Just <laughs> yeah, this is something I really, really like talking about. And then, of course, um, the last thing I talk about is um, these approaches, these new approaches, like ecological mangrove restoration. These are new things that, um, they may not be new, but maybe the way we are communicating them is very very different to the communities, to the different stakeholders that we are actually working with. Yeah, because so, it, it yeah. sounds also like that your method of working mm. also empowers the community and creates more, like also more trust and collaboration, but even if it's a bit challenging sometimes yeah. to bring together so many different yeah. stakeholders, it yeah. sounds like it's a solutions that are more sustainable and long-term. Yeah, absolutely, if I may illustrate yeah. that example. I mean, I spoke about strong community involvement. There are community groups in Indonesia who have now actually gathered together into uh, a platform yeah. which is actively dialoguing with uh, local and national governments actually on making sustained changes to the landscape there. And uh, maybe to illustrate the upscaling aspect uh, a bit yeah. more, I mean, Julie talked about like working on a landscape vision. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly what happened in the Damak area uh, in a constellation of a collaboration of a public-private partnership, having the, the national um, uh, government of Indonesia through their national ministry of um, 
marine affairs and fisheries heavily involved, uh, having private sector involved, engineering companies thinking along how best to make those bamboo uh, structures mm -hmm. and, uh, and improving those, mm -hmm. and having um, actually universities involved. What has happened actually in terms of upscaling is that the national government uh, saw the example, saw the, uh, how it was successful, and has replicated it to 13 districts in Java, Lombok, and Sulawesi wow. in Indonesia. Mm. Another thing on upscaling what happened is that the universities uh, involved have actually incorporated nature-based solutions into their uh, teaching towards engineers. And over a couple of thousand students, young generation, new generation, mm -hmm. uh, water professionals have been taught about nature-based solutions there. And wow. those kind of examples of upscaling, innovation, uh, I mean, there's so much uh, exchange, not only with the Ethiopia case, we're also mm -hmm. spreading it to other landscapes, but also to the broader audience here. I mean, we need to put water and wetlands up front in restoration efforts. Yeah, um, and it sounds like you're giving a lot of examples from the results in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And how is that work going with like aligning and taking those kind of learnings and like adapting and put it into place in East Africa and West, Af West East Africa? This is where the wetlands for resilience comes in handy because the whole idea is to have communities of practice where we can bring all these people together so that they can learn from each other. You can see already I'm, I'm sort of demonstrating to you how I've already learned from the DeMarc case. I've actually visited it. I thought the, the nature-based solution was just something that was out there that could not actually be done. Mm -hmm. But I've actually seen it work in, in DeMarc. So being able to create those communities of practice, the exchange visits, uh, being able to um, have situations where the two different teams are talking to each other so they can actually learn from each other. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It feels like you're both so passionate and you have so much knowledge and we only have limited time. But also before I start asking the concluding questions, is there something more that you feel like oh, I, well, I really want to add that perspective or mm. the learning from the mm. Julie. I think for me, what I'd go back to the global biodiversity framework. Yeah. I think we set targets, the 30% of wetlands that were, I mean the 30% of inland waters that we need to restore. I think there's a good chance to do that, to do that with these initiatives, where you're using more of a landscape approach. And then the recognition that it takes a long time to do this. So sometimes we invest maybe for three years, for two years, for a year, but really you can't get, really get where you want unless you think long term, you think landscape. So for me, that's the message I'd like to, to put out there. Yeah. So that people really think of how they can put in place such initiatives to move this forward. Huh? Thank you. And yeah. also just, and you, you're going to be able to add, but I also yeah. to throw in a question, mm. which sometimes it's, it's a lot of challenges to find the long-term investments or to get different stakeholders, as like you were saying, you're working in Indonesia, to invest and have a long-term commitment. How is that work working also in, for b do you feel like you have the support needed to reach those targets? Well, definitely it is a, an, a challenging issue, but having like a 10 year ambition uh, expressed as like, well, let's work on this together uh, for 10 years gives a really good basis uh, for further accelerating and finding additional uh, resources to make the work on the ground happen actually. And there was also in Indonesia, I mean, it started in 2012 in a small uh, scale with just uh, a small grant. And then uh, combining a mixed uh, approach of different financing modalities has ensured that it has now accelerated. Um, yeah, I was very much uh, liking what J Julie was explaining about the global biodiversity framework and what, is, uh, what would you want to, uh, to add to that. I think... Just to add, I mean, the examples in the field show that it can work and that it does work yeah. if applied well. And it, but it requires uh, really strong collaborative approaches involving communities in a participatory way. And then 
landscape approaches, working across a landscape can work. And I was recently in, uh, in Ethiopia where actually, I mean, you get always inspired from field visits, mm -hmm. but we were in the landscape where we work on restoration and this village leader was uh, actually making the best quote uh, ever to me, he was saying, well, you see the youth working on restoration, they're re-greening re the environment, they get a livelihood support, uh, income from that, but they also, more importantly, they get hope for the future for this. Yes, and actually beautiful. my vision for this landscape is actually that it's re-greened in 10 years time. We have an eco-tourism going on here. And the fact that this uh, village leader spoke in terms of like a landscape approach, a vision, um, yeah, was for me really exciting and inspiring and shows that it can yeah. be done and we should do it together. Thank Thanks. you so much. It's beautiful to hear. And also now we're running out of time, but just to give you the opportunity also to 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 share some, some closer remarks and also take us back to the wetlands in East Africa and the community around it, like you were doing. What do you want to share? Yeah, for me, the communities have a dream. If you go out there, they really want to see those wetlands brought back to where they were. And they understand what uh, the importance of these wetlands are to them. So agreeing with him again, important to bring them on board, bring all stakeholders of, um, on board to be able to reach some of those restoration targets that we really want to, to reach. And then my final word is that wetlands are kidneys of the earth. We need to conserve them. Thank wow, you. thank you so much, yeah. both of you, for sharing so much knowledge and, and passion around this issue. Mm. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you for everyone joining us uh, online. Mm. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>